Welcome guys to the Dropout Podcast. Here we invite ambitious and curious dropout, rebel, outsider, underdog. Today we welcome Tugan, one of my friends who dropped out from one of the most prestigious business schools in France to launch a series of business in crypto, in SaaS, in uh, online training. So I'm very happy to get him. Welcome my friend, how are you? Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm great. And uh, yeah, so let's, I'm quite happy to discuss like the dropout challenges. Perfect. Yeah. So for the people who don't know you, maybe you can introduce yourself like in one minute. Sure. Um, I own a few like Web2 and Web3 businesses. Um, <laughs> and I recently published a book called Token Titans that is specialized on Web3 marketing. That is a niche mm -hmm. that was really filled. And uh, I dropped out, out of um, university, uh, I think it was 10 years ago. So like right now I'm 32. It was like a while ago. And, uh, mm -hmm. and we uh, tried like, a variety of businesses, business ideas, fed a lot of things, tried also different countries because big challenge for me is to find a country where to live. And it's still a challenge today. And um, yeah, it's where I'm at. Can you tell me more about like your childhood? You were born in France, in next to Paris, I think. Uh, can you tell me like what type of child you were, like the, the shining wall, the popular one, the shy one? What was your, your childhood looks like? I mean, I grew up, I think I was lucky enough to grow up in a normal family. So, you know, <laughs> parents not divorced, relatively mm -hmm. stable, uh, not super wealthy, but not poor. So I think I had the luck of this balance thing, mm -hmm. um, which could be detrimental because when, you are, when you're in this balanced environment, you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have a super strong drive because people who are in difficult like, environments, they might have a super strong drive or people who have like, who grew up in these super like, success, successful families, they have the pressure to perform. You know, I was like kind of like in this in-between situation. And, um, and yeah, I mean, like my drive was, I, I kind of disliked society and all these rules as a kid. Like, again, you know, it's, it's quite basic, but I had to go to school. It wasn't really my thing. You have to go okay. there because some governments you didn't vote for, obviously as a kid, decided that you have to be to, in school and then you have to spend like all your childhood there learning things that you could learn pretty much on your own, I mean, most of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't have internet back in the days, or we had like the beginning of Wikipedia, because like, I'm 32. So like, mm -hmm. for me, Wikipedia arrived just at the end of high school or something like this. So, just, okay. um, and so I, did, I, did, like, I think I didn't really fit into the school system. I was relatively a shy person, an introverted mm -hmm. person. And, um, and I always had like a, a desire to make money because, and because through money, you can gain like independence. You can like make your own choices. You can decide like you know, when to wake up in the morning, what to do. So I had this early on this drive to be like, hey, I, I want to, to really make money. But without having this entrepreneurial spirit. So I, I wasn't okay. like you know, programming stuff or like launching stuff. And, mm -hmm. and somehow it was more difficult at my time because we didn't mm -hmm. have YouTube channels teaching you everything. We didn't have like Shopify, ClickFunnels. We didn't have crypto. We didn't have, like, there was pretty much nothing. So... Mm -hmm. So it was harder, but still, I didn't really have this entrepreneurship spirit. So I wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to make money maybe the classical way to, okay, let's do some good, let's study math and let's do some okay. kind mm -hmm. And And um, even if I wasn't great at math, <laughs> and um, and you know, then of course, and then I studied like math in like, I mean, not only math, math, economics and all stuff. And then I went okay. to university, to business school, and I was like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Um and it was 2012, 2013, it was, let's say the beginning of the entrepreneurship like trend in France, mm -hmm. uh, where it was suddenly cool to be an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. I was like, hi, hey, I mean, if I look at the, at the math, I hear, I was like, how much can I make by finishing university and working in a big corporation? Plus you have to take, to take into account like cost of living in these big like Western cities and taxes mm -hmm. versus, you know, selling a product online, printing an online business. I was like, hey, this whole thing just does this whole like business school thing just doesn't make sense. Like it doesn't add up. So I okay. drop out after three I think after three months I drop out. I think around twenty one, something like this, twenty twenty one. You tell me like during your childhood you were attracted by money, you wanted to, to make cash, you wanted to uh, to not specially create a startup but to make like some uh, some earnings. Uh, yeah. did you experiment things during this time, like even like a uh, job uh, uh, physical job or any experimentation during this moment? Yeah, I mean, I did a lot of stupid jobs, mm -hmm. you know, low-paid stupid jobs. Like uh, the summer, I would, for instance, work in like um, in, a, in a painting company. Like so, you go like on the in this house in construction, you just like paint the walls. And okay. I did a few jobs like this that just convinced me that physical labor is tough. 
and mm -hmm. um <laughs> not that's super enjoyable so i was like okay maybe let's focus on more like intellectual things and did you try any things online the only thing we tried is to scam online casinos by you know betting on the red and doubling like each time and okay and it worked for a while and then like casinos they have algorithm to of course like see you and identify you and then you have like 24 like you know, black color in a, in an arrow, which is like statistically not impossible, but like close to zero. And, okay. uh, and then, you know, we got scammed like this. So I tried a few things like this with a friend. Okay. Um, he had more than me, like this entrepreneurial spirit. So he was looking for like 80s stuff, things. And I was okay. more a follower. Um, okay. And, and do you think like, it, it's a very good point. Do you think like having at least one friend who you could discuss about money, cash, ambition, etc helped you grow at some point? Yeah. 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 I mean, what I like is, you know, being part of a small group mm -hmm. that is deviant in comparison with social norms. Mm -hmm. because the whole group is very homogeneous. So they're very, very similar. Yeah. So you have this small group of radicals. They all think the same, but in, let's say, we're in conflict uh, with like social norms or with like society. I mean, in, in Non-violent conflict, of course, but like, you know, just like, boom, like, bye. Okay. So for you, like, being surrounded by people who share maybe the same ID, same value in some kind of things, not in everything, because you can agree with everyone on everything, but sure. having, like, a small group of people who you can surround yourself with helps you, like, maybe get some opportunities, accelerate in business, but in life in general? Um, I would say that... If you want to achieve things, it's better to be part of a team anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's a solo business, you can be in a team, a lot of people having solo businesses and you're part of this cluster. Of and if you look through history, there's an interesting theory from Peter Thiel mm -hmm. um, about these like small homogeneous deviant groups. And it's like the founding fathers of the United States were a small deviant group, but very homogeneous in their values and what they stand for. But also, mm -hmm. if you take like negative like groups, you take like uh, terrorist organizations, for instance. Uh, they also have this like framework, like a small group, super like homogeneous in terms of like okay, we believe in this and we are fighting this, but mm -hmm. you know in conflict with norms or with the rest of society. And um, so I think it's quite quite important. On the other hand, you might also get into this echo chamber, where everyone thinks the same thing. And where it gets quite mediocre. And this I would like a little bit challenge. You know, this, I mean, right now you have this whole trend of, you know, solo printers make money online. And it's great. And I'm part of this movement too. But it's getting quite mediocre because everyone wants the fast dopamine, the fast money, the overnight success. You know, everyone wants to make money in 48 hours in these kind of communities, but no one wants to be, to be a millionaire in 48 months. And 48 months is is still reasonable to make like a millions or more, especially if you're young. If you're 15, mm -hmm. times is more expensive. But if you're like in your 20s or even before, you're mm -hmm. still okay, you know, to, and actually it could be like maybe like two years, not necessarily four years. But to go. Mm. Well, um, it's true that with like the development of uh, socials and all those entrepreneurship contents, people are become like more and more impatient because they see you can get this from zero to one in like a few days and so you become more ambitious and that's... what well, they think, but it's not really the case. You will yeah. always find overnight successes. That's exactly part of the, you know, the statistic pool. Like, you know, you, you will find these events. Exactly. Um, but it's, you know, then, then you end up with Grant Cardone telling you, hey, you shouldn't buy a Rolls Royce while he is in his Rolls Royce, you know. Um and then, and of course, he explains, but too late. You know, you you have this that dissonance. Internet bring you like so much value and knowledge, but also bring you like so much uh, possibility to fail and so much possibility to create FOMO and to get out of your things. Internet is very like something that make the natural selection. You know, you mm -hmm. go on the trap or you you take the good of internet and of online content based on what you want to do, and you have more chance to succeed. True. True. I think one notion I would like maybe introduce for your audience mm -hmm. is a notion of like apprenticeship. I don't know the exact like um, English like pronunciation for it. It's like, you know, to work with an expert. You know, like in the Renaissance, you had like a Michelangelo and you wanted to learn sculpture. You would go to Michelangelo and work for years for Michelangelo. And, you know, mm -hmm. after 15 years of like helping Michelangelo, 
copying Michelangelo, doing everything, you know, you could start your career as a sculptor, mm -hmm. as a sculptor, like as, as an artist. And mm -hmm. I think right now people are like, especially people from our generation or people who are even younger than us, they're like, yeah, no, fuck this shit, you know, I can watch a tutorial and I can fucking do it. In some time it works, but in most cases it just fails. Or they make money pretty much by accident and then they just lose it, gamble it away, try some crazy shit, buy a Lambo, go to Dubai, whatever. And then they go back to square one and they're like, oops, actually, it was luck. It wasn't skills. And this is also a pattern mm -hmm. I see. Like, because I'm, I've been teaching, like, web to marketing, I've been teaching to a lot of young people who are like 17, 18, uh, 90, 20, whatever, right? Quite young. Mm -hmm. Most, a lot of them made money pretty much by accident. You know, the right timing, you go hardcore, boom, you make some money, 100,000, whatever, pay some tax. Um, and then, mm -hmm. boom, you know, you spend it away and you never manage to, re to, to do it again. And this is mm -hmm. super common. Whereas if you go like, and if you go an apprentice, apprentice, um, you won't make a lot of money because you're pretty much going to work for close to nothing. You're going to work for like thousand bucks, two thousand bucks a month, max, max, max. And the reason is someone has to wipe your ass. Someone has to teach you everything for free. Someone has to correct you. Someone has, someone has to introduce you to other experts that you can, where, where you can ask questions. And I think people who go this way and I saw it with people who that, that I trained personally because they joined my companies as students and they worked for me for like the first year, slave work, like, you know, like the nastiest task. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in, in between, like, you know, he was learning stuff and then like more interesting stuff. And then usually the third year, he's like, yo, fuck off. I'm going to do my business. I'm like, okay, that's great. Sure. Um, and it's cool. Um, but then these people have much stronger results. Um, yeah. So it, it's something that's worth considering. It's not that dopamine friendly because you're going to be someone else's slave, pretty much. So it's not about like Wi-Fi money, internet freedom, uh, geographical freedom, whatever. It's about like learning the skills, building the network. And when you work close to someone for a long period of time, you also work with his network. And you're also going to be recognized by his network. Mm -hmm. And... I will take an example. There's a guy I like in Web2 Marketing. His name is Steve Larson. And he, he was like the guy doing all the annoying tasks for Russell Branson, the founder of ClickFunnels. So for years, he was just a guy, you know, setting up the webinars, reading the scripts, checking the slides, uh, doing all these things and for, for, for years. But, you know, he built the network. He built the recognition. He built the skills. And then he was like, hey, I want to launch my own things. And, you know, his own things. And I think and it, within two months, is he made like, I don't know, one, two million, something like this, within two months. And, uh, and like in pure raw profit, not, not just mm -hmm. like, you know, oh, I made like revenues. No, no. <laughs> um, and I think it's an interesting story. So I'm, I'm not trying to sell people like to be a slave for someone else, but mm -hmm. to this like little seed. So it's also worth considering. It's not as fancy, but... Yeah, it's like a shortcut because you are going to become a millionaire in three years. Definitely. And in three years, you will have the network of people who are already millionaires or already super successful. And mm -hmm. you wouldn't have this network without this. Yeah. I, I think what, what you say is very interesting. There's like two things that I I want to point out. It's first like the idea of experimenting, experimenting mm -hmm. for your own project, but also like being with someone who can help you or being with other people or being with uh, someone who have already achieved successful thing on your industry where you want to become good at, it's definitely something that people should do and that people should be afraid of because a lot of people are afraid of doing this because like you say, they don't want to see, to be seen like a slave. They want, they don't want to, to work for other people, but it's not just about working and having a job. It's just experimenting, knowing people and creating your leverage. And when you start, you don't have leverage. You don't have all this kind of thing that's, uh, experimenting can bring you. And the no second thing that is pretty interesting is the notion of mentor. I don't know if you ever got a mentor. Maybe you would tell us about, about your stories. But for my side, for example, when I was young, I was pretty close mind around this. I was like, I don't want a mentor. He's going to be like my my boss. He's going to tell me what to do, what to not do. And I was very like close mind because in movies and in what you see online, mentors are see like a, a kind of like boss and you're kind of there. Uh, the, the the slave at some point, you know. But the more I realized and the more I grew, I realized that like mentors are like linked to experimentation. Again, are very like game changers, and you just have to find 
the good one or the good ones and find a way to collaborate together, have like a genuine relationship with them, you know? Um, relationship is quite important. I think I did the same mistake as you. I was like, yeah, I fucked them all. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, to do this. I don't want to get a mentor. I don't want to be in this like relationship. Um, and then I, I went even more far. I was like, I don't even want to buy online trainings. Books, why not? But I was not going to pay like uh, like uh, for online trainings. And and I'm not trying to tell you you should buy an online training and I don't have anything to sell. Um, mm -hmm. But I would have been much faster, you know, mm -hmm. with this. Um, and, uh, I, I, and I didn't do it. So I think like I lost like I, due to arrogance. This is just being arrogant. Mm -hmm. um, so due to arrogance, I really wasted like two, I think like two, I, I wouldn't be two or four years of learning mm -hmm. curve where I could have moved so much faster by just being like, hey, I'm going to ask someone for help, for advice. And this guy is selling a, a class. Looks interesting. Maybe it's shitty. I mean, other than he has a refund policy, it's the worst case scenario. I asked for a refund, a partial refund. And I was like, no, fuck this shit. Or just like people selling like online courses or scammers. And <laughs> we were yeah. just like ironical because I was also selling like information products. But you know, that's just like schizophrenia. But I think like it's it's not just about online courses. Like you were blocked like many of us of investing in your knowledge, in your learnings. And this is very like true and a lot of... Uh, the young readers are like this, you know, they don't want to invest too much because they think that everything is online or everything can be provided by school. And so you don't want to go deeper on some subjects you want to grow, but at some points you need because specific knowledge have a cost. Yeah. And basically you're exchanging money for time. And mm -hmm. this is the right thing to do. Like, you know, the whole idea of like make money, like this whole like internet freedom thing is like, hey, you know, I want to get more time. I want to use yeah. money as a leverage to have more time for myself. So mm -hmm. if you're really in this mindset and, you know, by buying a training, if it's a good one, like an online course, you're buying, you're, you're buying time because mm -hmm. you will, you can find the same information online free. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's going to be in the middle of other informations. And some of them are not qualitative and you will have to try a lot of these things to find what truly works. And this will cost resources, time, and money. So if you are, if you, like, the name of the game is to use money to get time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're in this mindset, it's worth considering. Um, even if right now I have the feeling that there's some change in the market where mm -hmm. you can actually get for free most of the stuff. Like, you know, um, I think one of the pivotal moment was uh, Alex Hormozy introducing acquisition.com where he's like, hey, Instead of selling this stuff for like 1K or to sell a mastermind for like 10K or whatever, I'm going to give it for free. So I just kill the competition. And then, you know, if people have interesting businesses, I'm going to invest in their business and partner with them. So by mm -hmm. changing the business model, I think he ruined somehow the industry of selling classes. Of course, it's not completely, but a little bit. Yeah. So that's interesting developments too. Definitely, definitely. And I, will, I was thinking like, the moment you decided to drop out and you you left like education, um, where uh, and how did you manage your uh, learning curve and your learning session? Because school and education provide you a structure. They provide you um, an agenda. They provide you a calendar. They provide you the type of course you will follow, etc. And for most of people, most of the contents is like an obligation and not something that interests you deeply. Mm -hmm. But for most of the people, the framework and the structure help you, especially when you are young. Well, How did you manage this chaos, which is the life at some point? Life is chaotic. Like, you know, structure yeah. is something to make you this on stress, but like life is chaotic. How do you manage for yourself to get times to build, get times to learn, get times to grow and all of these kind of things without structure, you know? You're pointing a very valid point and risk. And I think the first years I was just reading everything I could read about sales, marketing, networking, fundraising, even if it never raised funds. Um, also entrepreneurship things, psychology, human psychology, collective psychology, crowd psychology, um, color psychology. Um, so I was reading a lot. I was watching a lot of videos. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for the first year and a half, I was thinking I was doing something, but actually I was just learning. Because I was trying a few things, didn't really work. 
Mm -hmm. And then I found like a way to make a little bit of money by, you know, teaching like um, economics, like to, to students. Like, so I had this like one to one sessions on Skype, charge okay. like bucks an hour and um, my use platform fees and taxes. And, um, and then, so I was making a little bit of money like this. So I could pay the rent and I could learn. So the first two years I was just like learning intensively in a messy way, not experimenting enough and not taking any fast tracks. Either because there was no online course or I didn't want to buy anything except books. Okay. And even yeah. books, I was buying them second hands, you know, to save some money, yeah. which, is, which is fine. Or I was trying to find them illegally in PDF, yeah. from like work on websites to, to get the stuff for free. Okay. Um, so, yeah. And so after like this first few years of learning, uh, what was like the trigger of you saying now I need to act more than I learn or in the same time or maybe change my 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 way of thinking of learning is not the same that acting because at some point you learn also by acting yeah. and by experiencing. But I mean I was acting because to sell like online lessons you need to sell yourself, to market yourself, to uh, okay. to present it in a desirable way, to understand mm -hmm. like the outcome of psychology. Um mm -hmm. so then I moved from like selling one to one sessions to sell an information product with all the lessons pre-recorded the written like you know elements and everything and and so then this is where i had the big like you know pivot because i was like okay so in the first month i made like twelve thousand euro mm -hmm. and for me it was a huge amount of money in the next mm -hmm. month i made like eight thousand five hundred something like it was like wow i made 20k and this is like pure profit after that's mm -hmm. um so this changed my way so this i mean By changing the minimum, uh, you experiment, you try to find a higher leverage for profitability and growth. You find mm -hmm. it, your business will change or you will just do another or different business. And then you continue and then you move to the next one. So for me, it's like, okay, one-to-one -one course. Nice. I can make like 3,000 a month. Cool. I can pay the rent. Um, then, you know, I can sell courses. So I have to focus on like marketing, social networks, a little bit of retargeting. Uh, and then just building the course and customer support and sometimes... Mm -hmm the phone to convince someone that the product is great okay now i have this like online teaching business where i'm teaching like uh, economics uh, then i'm like hey economics is cool it's a very profitable business but it's a, it's a very small market it's a very narrow market where are the big <laughs> market health wealth relationship and what do i really like well i mean i do like marketing and i've been doing marketing now for a while so i was like um maybe i can create an like, information product in the make money sphere. So I found like some product on uh, clickbank.com, which used to be like this huge affiliate network with the scammiest product ever. Uh, not not only scams, but you have a lot of sketchy things on <laughs> bank to yeah. the list. But the marketing is always cool and funny. So I was like checking all of these, downloading like the video sales letters. And I was like, hey, I could actually do the same thing in the French speaking market. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I moved from making like, you know, 10,000 or like five to 12,000 a month, let's say, to making 10 to 100,000 a month. Mm -hmm. with this so I did this for a while and then like completely stopped the economics the hard thing is to kill the previous business it's to be like mm -hmm. okay this works I have to cut the previous business I mm -hmm. cannot manage a portfolio of activities I'm not smart enough to do this I don't have a big enough team to do this so don't mm -hmm. use so I had to cut 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 so once the new thing started to really take off I was like okay I need to cut the previous one either put the stuff for free or you know, just change it but like I have to cut it so I cut it and I did this like And this was like my hardcore marketing time. So it was like this super psychological, super strong, like copywriting things uh, only in the French speaking market. Uh, you might argue it was a little bit sketchy, but we always made sure to have like great products. So we had this policy, marketing is super aggressive. The product has to be great and refund policy has to be for dummies. You don't like to take money back. Immediately. So, you know, from the karma, you're like, okay, you know, strong marketing, but then, you know, risk-free for people. Did that for a while, but then it wasn't really fulfilling. I was like, oh, shit, I do miss teaching. And I went back to like, okay, I'm going to teach. But this time I'm going to teach everything I learned in these years of like hardcore marketing. And uh, I created this business, still in the French speaking market, to teach like the hardcore marketing. And I did mm -hmm. that for a while. I could train a lot of young, super smart, talented people, uh, and also less younger people. And it was very nice. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting. And then, you know, 20, 2021, I was like, I like teaching, but I don't like to sell the teaching. So I don't like to be in this dynamic where you have to sell the teaching, you have to sell the production product. 
mm-hmm. I don't have fun there anymore. I like to teach and I'm still teaching today. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't want to have to do it. I don't want to be paid for it. I don't want to have to pay people for money. So so I was like, okay. and then I was like, oh, there's crypto. And in crypto, I was like, okay, everyone is just like aping into the next like. Just when it's the first time you hear about crypto? Uh, as an investor, 2017. Okay. And, and you decided to be interesting about this like in, in 19, right? 2021. I think in 2020, I started to be in touch with people who had crypto businesses. And they were like, hey, man, like, I have this issue or I'm writing this thing. No one, no one understands it. Or I have this thing. And, and I was looking at it with a like, yeah, just Just by using common sense and explaining it clearly what your product is doing, you know, yeah. you get higher results and higher engagement. So I did that a little bit like to help them like pro bono for free. Um, because it was like, hey, you which is at this time and even today, one of the main problem in crypto, people don't know how to vulgarize things in terms of product or even things. Yeah, common sense is completely missing. It's just mm-hmm. like common sense. Um, and then, you know, 2021, I was like, everyone is aping into this like shit coins or NFTs or PFPs. And, but who is actually building it? How is it built? Technically, how is it distributed? Is it making money? Uh, you know, and how? And how, how the economic value is moving? And I was like, hey, you know, it could be interesting. So, you know, I created a, a shitcoin. Shitcoin mm-hmm. being not a negative word in my mouth. And, you know, it went to 50 million market cap. We had no idea why, no idea how. Hype, 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 hype. But, 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 um, so I had little control over it, um, but anyway, uh, and then projects started to come to me, be like, Hey, you know, you are, what's your marketer? I'm like, sure. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> um, and then they asked me, so how should I do this? Uh, uh, which blockchain should I use? I'm like, uh, uh, is my lending page, does my lending page make sense? Uh, uh, does the token mix make sense? What can I change? And it was only common sense. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I had the possibility to join like I think 20 or 30 projects as a advisor sometimes it was just like you know having one phone call a month sometimes it was more day-to-day help and I could see like a whole variety of projects uh, from the super experimental crazy to the like very boring technical that no one really cares about Mm -hmm. and um, and then you know like bear market arrives so I could take a break and um, I know pretty much I'm back and I'm only focusing on helping with Web3 projects grow. And this is a lot of fun. Okay. We're going to discuss about this later on what you're doing exactly today. But I wanted to get back to your story. I, I took what is interesting that in your in your journey, it was very like step by step. You didn't start this business at your 20s to make like what you have today directly. You didn't want it to make a big ecosystem of a lot of things with Web3, Web2, etc. You started very step by step. Uh, going on where you are good, going uh, always with compound effects with the same target, etc. Yes. Uh, today, I think it's one of the most most challenging things. People want directly to go on ecosystem project. Uh, what is your opinion about this? And first, two things. The first thing is you're the guy who told me that ship light. Mm-hmm. And now I'm always keeping this in mind. And when I'm working with projects, uh, I'm like ship light, and they're like, oh, this is smart. Can you explain it for people who don't know uh, like, what is this concept of shape? Oh. Like flight is, I mean, it, this concept that actually you gave to me is like uh, the product has to be very simple, has to be easy to prop to code, has it been too easy to build? It has to be fast to launch, fast to ship, fast to explain, and it's not going to satisfy everyone, and it's going to be very limited. But at least it's done in two weeks and not in seven months with a stupid agency, make it smaller, make it easier, make it simpler. And then the second thing is try to have this compound over your niche or over your audience or over your like existing customer base. It's also something from you. Um, it's like, okay, you have this business in like, I don't know, like copywriting. What well, I mean, if you want to create a SaaS, create a SaaS on copywriting. So, you know, so it's the next logical step. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and really try to, to build, like to, to build up your assets. And audience is one of them. Customer base is one of them. Having a relationship to like a customer base is, is extremely important. 
uh, them knowing your face, your story, what about yourself? Uh, it's super important because I have customers who have been with me for 10 years. They were like, paying like 30 bucks on Skype, you know, to, to have me as a teacher and knows, you know, they are like, creating Web3 projects and they're like, hey, I want you as an advisor. I can give you 5%, 10% of the profit shares. I'm like, yeah, sure. So it's interesting. Compounding the relationship, compounding the audience is super important. So ship light and then like grow on top of your existing things. So compound. Mm, I think like people right now, they think too much of business type, business ideas, etc. but not too much on what they can do and what, where they can be good. And I think they should like, it's, it's Sam Altman who just said this, like I saw like an interview. He say like, if I have an advice to give to young people, it's like, don't think too much about business type, business ID, business things. Think about how you can be good at something and what you can bring and go experiment with this kind of industry in this kind of industry with this kind of things and take the risk, take courage to go all in. And this is what you mentioned, like this idea of cutting an old business on all things that do doesn't uh, serve your, uh, your, your, your main business or your activity. You have to cut it. A lot of people think they can be make a lot of project completely different in the same times. I truly believe that if you want to do something ambitious at one point, it will be unfocused. It will not be like something that's within inside six people, etc. I mean, I think that people who are able to cut, cut people, cut ideas, cut, 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 cut previous businesses, who can mm -hmm. reply it and iterate and compound very fast, crush smart people with smart ID, with smart mm -hmm. money. I just crush them. You know, the people with like, you know, fancy degrees, internships at Goldman Sachs and Google, who are raising money and who are in this like fancy incubator in San Francisco or like, I don't know, London or Paris. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they maintain the illusion with fake money. So they get the fake money from the parents or the incubator, like some, I don't know, government program or some like VCs. And you know, mm -hmm. most of them are completely inefficient. They have no business, they have no idea how to run a business. But you know, they can maintain the illusion from outside. You're like, wow, these dudes are they're, they're just learning it. They have like this like, 200% growth year to year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, if you're just throwing money from the window, burning some cash with no hope of, like, any business model profitability, and some people are stupid enough to give you money for this, this is not smart. It's yes. just the illusion of something working. And I think a lot of people are getting trapped into this. So you have this trap of this, like, you know, startup. Yeah, you know, you know he sold his startup. You know, he made it. Well, do you really know the terms? Startup is sold for, like, one, for one dollar, right? And it's just like an exit because it just finished. It doesn't didn't work. Yeah. But you know, you can sell it as a victory. Or you have people like having online businesses who are like bragging about like making millions and millions. So just, just something for people to keep in mind. I was a good friend of one of the richest guy in this like industry of like online businesses, stores, like information products, affiliation MLM. Mm -hmm. And he was the guy who was buying a lot of these businesses. He had like a lot of resources. And he became a closer friend. So he was sending me the deals. So I could see, for instance, the Stripe accounts of a lot of YouTubers, of a lot of like Shopify stores, a lot of stuff like that. And it's not as glorious as it looks like. Of course. Yeah, it's the same for every type of business. So I think you don't have to chase the successful successful stories that we show you online. Regarding your journey, also what I, I, I find very interesting with you is that you started your journey like by educating people, around marketing or on subject that you master and you can provide by yourself. But the moment you decided to, to go on project to maybe make something more scalable extra, you started surrounding yourself by people, by co-founders too. And you didn't want it to do all by your, by your, 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 your side. And it's also something that I think it's very interesting because at some point founders, uh, if they are smart and motivated, they can do all even for project right now, if you are not a technical guy, you can find a way to build something, you know. And yeah. for technical people, you can definitely do accounting. You can definitely uh, try to uh, do customer support. So everyone can do everything if you are motivated enough. But it's not the right decision to do if you want to do something ambitious. And I think what I like with you is that you know how to surround yourself with the right people uh, for your different activity. But the question now is like, how did you realize that you needed this kind of people? And how did you find them it's quite true that you can be good at everything so i learned to code i learned to program like very basic stuff like you know very mm -hmm. basic javascript and html uh, I, I, I always i hated it i was just bad at it learning curve was like disastrous i mean like you know for instance people are like hey you know go outside of your comfort zone 
and then you learn something new. And I'm like, I mean, to some extent, yeah, but maybe no. Maybe you want to co to compound where you are and where you have fun, pleasure, drive, success, results. It'll be like, can I go like a an X or a hundred X in this direction? Uh, is there a market for it? Is, are there like potential partnerships? So I will give you an example. I'm a very good economic teacher. Can I become the best economic teacher in France? Yes. Is it a big market, an interesting market? No. Okay. Web3 marketer. Can I become the best Web3 marketer in the world? Doable. A lot of work. Doable. How big is the market? Trillions. So, so it's like, it's okay not to, like, I think it's compound in what, I mean, I compound your comfort zone after check, after having checked if there's really a market or if there's really a mm -hmm. potential there. Um, mm -hmm. If there is no economic potential, it's fine. It can be a hobby. It's okay to have fun. Um, but yeah, the size of the market matters. So if, if the market is huge, then compounding, compounding your autism somehow uh, might, uh, might make sense. Partnering with people who can do different things is usually the good way to go. It's a very hard thing because partnering is just super hard. Uh, mm -hmm. And dynamically over time, it's, it can get very conflictual because mm -hmm. different people have different perceptions. Communication is different. Usually when someone has skill, a skill set completely different to yours, it mm -hmm. also has a different mindset. Mm -hmm. The programmer doesn't think like a marketer. Uh, mm -hmm. So this can create like conflict. So partnering is a way to go. Um, but it's conflictual and a way to manage the conflicts is to build leverage. My vision on this is that when you have a partner, uh, you have definitely like the, the, the skills, uh, complementary. Mm -hmm. So if you're good at marketing and you have your leverage at marketing at some point, you have to be decisional on marketing stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you have like a partner more in the tech side at some point, even if you don't agree with some points, you have to let him, uh, decide at some point. After yeah. it's never black and white. There is every time moments that uh, there is like friction on it. For example, in a tech company, you often have a CTO and a CEO, but it's very difficult that the CEO of a tech company don't drive the product uh, vision and growth. But yeah. you have a CTO and the CTO have to get like a minimum of ambition and vision of it. So it can create uh, it can create like uh, some friction. But I think you have to see it like a normal relation, ever like a romantic relation. It's about communicating and finding a way, etc. And of course, in terms of uh, um, like the, the 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 risk management, the privatization, and the decision, I think the rage you create uh, make you feel more legitimate or not to take decision. And it's it's about making it uh, valuable in long term. I think at the end of the day, it's like your leverage. And in a, in a very positive way, it's not your leverage to put pressure on other people. It's your leverage to have choices and options. And when you come, you add so much value that, you know, it's it's good for everyone to have you on board. Yeah. But, you know, we, we're really entering like an economic era or technological era where like you need to understand a little bit, a few things are on your field. You know, it's like this T-shaped, like, you know, skill. It's like, you know, like um, you need to understand a little bit of accounting, a little bit of flow, a little bit of like, uh, let's say tech, oh, okay. and then you need to have a field, a, a field, a skill, where you are number one in the world, and your aim is to be number one in the world. And you think and it's okay to have ambitious goals. Mm -hmm. People better underestimate the amount of work it requires and the amount of discipline. That's that's quite mm -hmm. clean. and the resilience because, like in the, in the quest, like every one of our project is not like what we imagine from it to be. It's not the initial ideas, not the initial team, etc. And so what is the factor of success that is the main important is like the resilience to after 10 years still work, be here working on marketing and you're the example at some point, you know, you're still working on marketing field differently with different market because you got different opportunity and you decided to size them and it's a right, a very good insight that you share to us. Uh, but you're still in the same field. You're not like doing like a, robot stuff right now you know what i mean <laughs> yeah i really compounded like in marketing and understanding like the human psyche i would like to ask you like to the draw thoughts the rubber to the outsiders who want to chase their own path uh, right now who have a mission who have like project in mind or not what you would recommend to them i mean i would have maybe a contrarian view on this i think i owe my success my success or i mean like or i owe the 
quality of the life I have that I enjoy a lot to studying. Because mm -hmm. before dropping out, I studied. Um, mm -hmm. you know, in France, we have this thing after high school, it's called like class prepa or like a prestigious mm -hmm. school where for two years, you only mm -hmm. do math, economics, philosophy, or stuff like this. It's extremely mm -hmm. competitive and you arrive there. To arrive there, you have to be the best in your class in high school. You get to be mm -hmm. like a good little soldier of the system. And then, you know, teachers are just trashing you. Everyone tells you how stupid you are. Every mm -hmm. mistake you make is just thrown in your face. And mm -hmm. it's just like a reality. And then it, it trains you to be strict, to be like, to have like this, okay, so math is math. You know, uh, mm -hmm. philosophical reasoning is not YOLO. I mean, it has rules functioning, like you have, you have ways of, to reason, to go to, to first principles, to question things. I I can thank my, my like, uh, let's say, standardized education for a big part of my success. So, you know, Steve Jobs, he dropped out from good stuff, Mark Zuckerberg from Harvard, so, and me from a shitty French stuff, but <laughs> not taking myself in the same league, of course. But, you know, it's not completely dumb. Like, the system, I mean, I don't know, then it depends in different countries. I don't know how it is right now. Uh, in the U.S., it's obviously stupidly expensive, so... And in France, mm -hmm. it's quite cheap. So in the U.S., yeah, it's so stupidly expensive that it's changing like completely the equation. The formal education is helpful. And something like I have a lot of successful people who had like formal education, although who do not. Fully. I think that's a very interesting point is that don't drop out because it's cool or because like you saw like the Steve Jobs movie. Definitely, I think it's something that yeah. it's interesting that point out. And nobody did on my previous podcast. And I think it's good. And it's even better that it's come from you <laughs> who are like, have like quite unconventional ideas online. Uh, so I definitely agree with this. At some point, I think people want to drop out. It's because they want to chase a very structured uh, conviction ID that school will just like make them uh, make barriers to it, you know, at some point. I mean, that is really depending on the individual, the country and the of course report they have. Tugan, it was a pleasure to get you on the, the podcast. Honestly, it was cool. We are friends since a few years, but right now I have a I have learned more things about you, so pretty cool. I hope you enjoyed this uh, this podcast, and uh, thank you very much uh, for your time, and thank you, Grant. Thanks for the invitation, and thank you all for watching it. Have a nice day.